right, let's get an investor take now with David Bonson, chief investment officer at the Bonson Group. He's owned J.P. Morgan for about 15 and a half years, and he joins us now. And it was a great quarter for J.P. Morgan as well. Uh, that stock is up solidly, David, about 5%. When would you sell? <laughs> Well, we would sell when they stop growing the dividend so robustly, which is their signal to us investors that, that they continue to have confidence in their business. So that's why we're dividend growth investors, Alex, because the dividend is the signal. J.P. Morgan's dividend coming out of the financial crisis was 20 cents a year. It is now $5 a year. Oh, yeah. The dividend is up 25x since the financial crisis. So is that really like a quality than dividend play versus like a cyclical economy play for you? Oh, very much so. I mean, we've owned it for 15 years. We're up about seven times on our money, not counting the dividend. And J.P. Morgan is far and away the best bank in the world. Keep in mind, Wells Fargo is up a lot today, and they're up 100% since the financial crisis. J.P. Morgan's up 700%. That's the difference between the best bank and the second best bank. I mean, it's really just light and, uh, and night and day in terms of their competitors. I'm just curious, uh, David, when we talk about uh, the health of these banks and more importantly, some of the commentary that we heard today about their view of the health of the economy and the health of the consumer. Are you in that camp, this idea here that there is that resiliency and that there is that proverbial soft landing that's going to actually help out this market? Well, I'm in the camp that wants to stay very humble about it because I recognize that there's data on both sides of this, and it's compelling data. And so to have an investment thesis that requires you to guess exactly what will happen with the economy and when has been a very bad idea for some time. Um, there's a compelling argument. It's not just about the consumer being resilient. The consumer cannot carry the economy because the consumer cannot consume things that aren't being produced. There has to be production. So CapEx is going to have to continue to materialize and productivity will have to increase. So we're supply siders to the core production first. But yes, the, the fruit you see from that has been healthy. Is there any concern about the election and more importantly, the result, meaning the type of administration we get and the potential impact of policy coming out of it? Yes, and I appreciate the question because I think it cuts both ways. There's things that could happen to impact markets or certain aspects of the economy from both candidates. Uh, I wrote a piece at my own dividendcafe.com summarizing. We sort of like gridlock if you do end up with a, a Harris administration but a Republican Senate. There's really nothing I worry about. They're not going to tax unrealized capital gains or other crazy ideas like that. Um, my, with the Trump administration, much of the concern is more around some of the cultural and social dynamics. I mean, I think in both cases, we have a divided society and there's a lot of social ills that are not going to be cured in this election. Mm -hmm. They're very likely going to be exacerbated. But all things being equal, we prefer deregulation and lower tax rates. But there's other things that matter right now in the economy. And I think politics is not even fourth on the list. Mm -hmm. Not even fourth, even though we might get some tariffs happening. Really, not even fourth, David. Well, and here's the thing about the tariffs. I happen to know and be very close with many folks that were inside the administration. I think President Trump was obsessed with the Dow, obsessed with the S&P. And so what is the worst case outcome there? He's told us he wants to use tariffs as a negotiating tactic. I don't know how they're a negotiating tactic when you tell the other side that you're using them to negotiate. But let's say they implement 200 percent tariffs on John Deere, which I think is up monstrously since he threatened to do that. Um, and then the market drops a lot. I think he then capitulates. Like, there's no sense in which I believe there will be standing, ongoing tariffs mm -hmm. that are able to take away, even though I'm against the tariff policy. All right, Dave, before we let you go, I do want to go back to banks for a second and end there, because you just added Morgan Stanley on that, which in some ways makes sense when you saw the uh, solid equity trading uh, from J.P. Morgan. Why did you decide that was a good bet right now? Well, we added uh, Morgan Stanley about two weeks ago, and the equity trading is the last thing we would care about with Morgan Stanley, and that's by design from Morgan Stanley. You, you may recall, I was a managing director there for many years. I know the business very well. Ted Pick, their new CEO, might be the only person in America that loves dividends more than I do. He, uh, they're at a 3.8, 3.9% yield, one of the highest yielders in all of the financial sector, and they have the recurring free cash flow. Their business 
business is really annuitized. Wealth management, asset management fees, fixed income and equity trading and even investment banking are a very low percentage of their cash flows. So they're not as lumpy. Yeah. They have room to grow the dividend more out. All right. Got to leave it there. David, David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer over at the Bonson Group.